This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 61, for December 4th, 2009. Hi everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me today, my old colleague, Dick de Palmier. And getting older. Oh, I didn't hey, mean Vince. it in that sense. Dick. <laughs> I meant it in the sense that I've known you for many years. I know what you meant. I hope it was everybody a term else of does. endearment. I got it. I How are you it. doing, Dick? I'm doing well. Thank this is you. a momentous week for you, right? Um, it has been so far. Your whole life's been momentous, you're saying. <laughs> I have you no gave, regrets. You gave your last lecture. I did. In your par wait a minute. Parasitism course. No, Parasitic no, no. diseases. Parasitic diseases course. I did. At least I think it was my last lecture. You know, Dick, you should teach a course at Morningside. Well, if I'm asked, I'll do no, it. No, no, you don't. You want to ask? You just do it, like I did. Just I go said, down and do I it. I said I want to do this, and they allowed me to. Who do it. Who did you say that to? The director of uh, biology curriculum. Well, who, who I know, they would love a parasitic diseases course. I'm sure they would, or at least a lecture on it. I mean, wouldn't you like to keep teaching? But Dick, in this podcast, you're still teaching. I'm still teaching. In fact, teach. this morning in the shower, for some reason, I said <laughs> I have to tell Dick that even though you've taught your last. Biology of parasitism. Sorry. That's right. Whatever it is here Parasitic at Columbia. Diseases, yes. You can still teach via the podcast format. Oh, I, I, that's why I love this. And you have a huge audience. Well, growing. we have we have a huge audience. Yes, growing by the day. Exactly. So anyway, uh, many many more years of teaching in the new the new media. Thank you. Moving Vince. beyond the classroom. Right. In my course next semester, I'm going to use podcasting, blogging. Twitter, all that stuff to enhance the teaching experience, or I should say the learning experience. The learning experience. Right, so it's you and I today, Dick. All right, listen, I'm witches. No problem. None. We have a couple of interesting stories. The first one uh, is a paper from Public Library of Sciences, Pathogens, Plus Pathogens, as right. we fondly know it, deals with a bacterium called Wolbachia. Uh-huh. Which I know you know of. I do, of course. We have mentioned before. We have. But before we can talk about that paper, it, we have to go back to the original observation, which was about a year ago in 2008. It was a paper in PLOS Biology entitled, The Bacterial Symbiont Wolbachia Induces Resistance to RNA Viral Infections in Drosophila Melanogaster. That's fantastic, isn't it? So apparently these are obligatory intracellular bacteria. Correct. And there are many, many insects out there. Correct? Many. Many organisms. Besides, oh, I heard they're in some uh, helminths, right? They are. What do they do in the helminth? Do we know? They allow the helminth to induce pathology. So without the bacteria, they're not pathogenic? This is correct. Oh, that's interesting. Because here's the opposite. What this observation was in, back in December was by two different groups, and I'm looking at the paper from one group in the UK. They knew that these flies, Drosophila, by the way, Dick, Drosophila are used in the laboratory they are. to study genetics. Are they also found in the wild? They are. And in fact, guess who were the first ones to use them in the laboratory? Thomas Hunt Morgan. And Sturdivant. Sturdivant at and Columbia University. Stiles. And mm -hmm. who else? Theodosius Stubshansky. Stubshansky. I love the name. I do too. Actually, I, I told you I once I knew him. Yeah. He was a great man. But they're also wild in the... That's right. how they got them. They, well, you know what they did? They just left a bunch of bananas rot. And they Flies attracted will, to it. Sure. And they started their colonies. So if you way. have fruit lying in your house and it's overripe, it will attract fruit flies. You can't avoid it. Now, in this paper, they call them vinegar flies. Do you know why? I think it's an older term, mm -hmm. you know, a common okay. older term. Well, they knew that these uh, fruit flies were infected with Wolbachia. So they did an experiment to understand why. And they, treat, right. they treated them with tetracycline. An exactly. antibiotic to get rid of the bacteria. Sure. And then they infected them with a variety of viruses, some RNA viruses and a DNA virus. And what they found is that when the bacteria are present, mm -hmm. the RNA viruses don't grow as well. Huh. And the flies live longer. Right. They're not, so the bacteria in some way protect the flies from viral infection. They don't absolutely protect. They, they diminish. They right. significantly diminish. They give it an advantage. They give it an advantage, and they let them live longer. Sure. But that was only for the uh, RNA viruses, not the DNA 
containing virus. Very interesting. So the RNA viruses they used were Drosophila C virus, hmm. which is a member of a family called Dicystroviridae, and it includes cricket paralysis virus. And these are related to picornaviruses, poliovirus. Wow. They have a single-stranded plus sense RNA genome. Mm -hmm. It's encoding one long protein. In this case, there's actually two open reading frames, one and then a second separated by a, a little non-coding sequence. So what's the mechanism by which the RNA from the bacteria inhibits the translation of the plus-stranded RNA from the virus? That's interesting you should say that. You're assuming that that's the mechanism. <laughs> Did I you? ask that question correctly? <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the possibilities for what's going on here, um, that the bacteria is somehow involved in, in inhibiting translation or it's out-competing for nutrients. In fact, we don't know the mechanism. It's quite interesting. But it's, isn't it interesting that it's only for the RNA viruses? It they is. They tested not for DNA? It is. So one of the ideas was that maybe the bacteria sort of induce innate immunity. These flies have toll-like receptors and innate mechanisms. They have RNAi defenses. But if that were the case, the DNA virus should be in inhibited as well. And they're not. They also looked at a couple of other RNA viruses, norovirus and flockhouse virus, different virus families. They're also inhibited. Hmm. So that was the original paper. First observation, and they had a couple of interests. So they have great graphs in here where they show that the amount of virus that grows is way down, the flies live longer. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the discussion, they have a very interesting uh, summary. So Wolbachia is a common symbiont. So what does that mean, a symbiont there? Well, the concept of symbiosis is uh, rigidly defined by those that do work in it and um, loosely or incorrectly defined by those people that uh, <laughs> use <laughs> yeah. the word to indicate that they get along well with their wives <laughs> and husbands. We have a symbiotic relationship. Well, that's interesting because in a true definition of a symbiont is that two, they are two dissimilar species okay. that must interact in some way. That doesn't say the positive or negative ways that they interact. No, you they just have, have to interact, I see. That's correct. So like a lichen, for instance, would be a fungus and an algae that together can do more than either can do separately. I see. And that's a positive symbiosis. But you can have negative symbiosis as well. So it's thought that these uh, interactions between Wolbachia and viruses probably occur in nature. All the time. You I mean, would think that in nature, this bacterium is, pre is preventing infection or helping the flies or the insects, right? Well, the other thing it does is it allows certain um, parasitic wasps to behave parthenogenically, whereas without the bacteria, they would not. Correct. Yeah, they, they actually have a nice paragraph full of this, uh, these examples. And listen to this. This new host microorganism microorganism interaction adds to the perception that the response of a host to a pathogen depends on interactions with other microorganisms. Other examples include herpes-induced protection to listeria in mice. So this is an interesting, we've talked about before, example. Uh, if you infect mice with a certain herpes virus, they're protected from listeria infection. Interesting. Yep. Suppression of HIV-1 infection by human herpes virus 6. Symbiotic bacteria protection against fungi in a shrimp and an aphid. See that? Symbiotic bacteria protection against parasitic wasps in an aphid. That's what you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? And symbiotic bacteria protection against fungal infection in a wasp. Maybe that was the one you <laughs> <laughs> A recent report that gut flora has a protective role against dengue virus in Aedes aegypti. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Definitely. So, um, but gut flora is a little bit different than intracellular bacteria. Yes, that's right. Yes, we should point out that Wolbachia is intracellular. Right? Obligately so. It has to live inside the cells of uh, the insect or whatever the host is. So sort of like the rickets, the rickettsia, not rickets, rickettsia, right? right in that right. sense that they have to live within the cell. Exactly. So there must be in nature a selection for this interaction, right? Yes. I don't know what the bacteria get. I guess they get to live in a nice, a juicy, rich home, warm, warm cell, right? You bet. And the viruses, what the, the viruses don't benefit, but the mm. flies benefit from having the bacteria. Or the there. worms in this, you know. I, you know, because the worm that you were referring to before that we didn't mention was uh, its Oncocerca volvulus. Mm hmm. And it has an intracellular Wolbachia symbiont. And if you cure the worm of its bacteria, 
the pathogenicity goes way down in the host. So the pathogenicity of the worm is dependent upon the presence of the bacteria. So you might want to ask, what's the advantage for the parasite to induce pathology? Yeah. What is it? Well, I, I'd be darned if I can answer it. I don't I mean, know. I don't like the idea of, of microbes inducing pathology on purpose. Right. Unless it helps them transmit. Correct. Right? Right. I mean, why be more lethal if, only if it gets you to transmit better? Because in my view, transmission is really the key. Do you, do you think is, that's correct? Or is I that, do think that's correct. No, no, no. I think it's the, the reproductive uh, imperative, regardless of the life form, is the driving force in DNA biology. Now, period. Like RNA too, right? And RNA too. All right. Nucleic acid-based life forms. Do we know that's, any, do we, that's a more general do term. Do we know any other? Um unless you consider prions, but we've already talked about this. and I, They're we, not living, probably. They are not. Anyway, so the second paper, which is the PLOS pathogens paper, just came out in November. Same group or a different group? This is a group in Australia. Okay. Different group, the University of Queensland. Oh, yes. Ever been to Australia? Yes. I have. You know, I've Spent asked six you months. and you've told me, and, yeah, I, yeah. and I can't remember anything. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> anyway, this group, um, the title of the paper is Variation in Antiviral Protection Mediated by Different Wolbachia Strains in Drosophila simulans. Now, Drosophila simulans is a different species right. of fruit fly, I guess, Dick? Sure. And each, and they have different variants, and each has a different Wolbachia. Isn't that interesting? In a slightly different species. Is, that's amazing, right? But it's not unexpected, it is, is it? Well, it sort of makes you wonder how these things are acquired and, and what allows them to infect some groups and not other groups. Like, yeah. Why don't we all have symbiotic bacteria living inside of us? Yeah. Well, we have, we do, right? Don't we have symbiotic bacteria? We do, us? but they're not intracellular. Not intracellular, no. They're in our guts. That's right. And they do important things. Major sure. things. But you're right, not intracellular. Can we say not that we know of, or would we have seen them? I think we know. All right. Anyway, in this paper, they have tested the idea of, does every pair of Wolbachia in Drosophila inhibit virus infection? So they basically uh, made pairs. We generated paired simulans lines, either uninfected or infected with five different Wolbachia strains. And then each was challenged with that virus. I've already forgotten. It's, right. it's related to the poliovirus. The Dicistrovirus. <laughs> uh, Drosophila C virus. I have the right. abbreviation right in front of me, uh, Dick, DCV. Um, okay. And blockhouse virus. Significant antiviral protection was seen for some, but not all of the strain fly combinations. That's interesting. In some cases, this is interesting, protection from mortality was associated with a delay in virus accumulation. But some Wolbachia-infected flies allowed high titers of virus to grow, but the flies were okay, as long as the bacteria were present. <laughs> I mean, it obviated the pathology of the virus exactly. infection, but not the virus infection itself. Yeah, yeah. That's remarkable. Amazing. Yeah, and the, the strains that did protect occurred at a comparatively high density within the flies and were most closely related to, the, to this one strain, W. Mel. Wow. So they conclude that Wolbachia-mediated protection is not ubiquitous. So not every combination is going to be protective. So it kind of challenges our view of, of how we look at this. We think, ah, this is a great symbiosis. It protects the flies. In but nature, though, there must be a selection for those that do offer something. Absolutely. They, they must offer something else, right? They must offer something else. It may not be protection against the virus. But, or particular, these, maybe not these viruses. Maybe there are other viruses. Sure. Or something else. Right. Absolutely something else, right? Yep. What could that be, Dick? Do you have any idea? Um, well, I, I would agree with you. I think it probably is other virus other species. Viruses. Yeah. So look at this figure. This is very nice. They do these. This is a great uh, experimental system because you can either treat or not treat with tetracycline, and mm -hmm. you have matched pairs of flies you have with or without the bacteria. Good built-in controls. Yeah. So you infect these flies. Look at them die away. By eight days, they're all dead. Amazing. Without the bacteria. But with the bacteria, they live longer. It's fabulous. Nice and significantly system. longer, not just a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, here we have some of them living, yeah, only 80% or, or only 20% are dying. So and this reminds me of your mice, uh, notobiotic mice. Mm. Did anyone or has anyone ever asked whether notobiotic mice are more susceptible to virus infections? Of course they have. I'm sure that that's a, a question that's risen early on in the development of the notobiotic system. 
And but the answer to which I have not. I don't know. I don't have an answer there. Very interesting. In those days, I was a worm man. <laughs> anyway, so it's a good question, though, right? It's a, an excellent question. The mechanisms or processes by which Wolbachia protects the host from virus are not yet understood. And they give many possibilities, but we don't understand them. Wait a minute. How would you go about dissecting it to understand it? Well, I'd try and get this to work in a cell. Get a cell system where you can put these bacteria in them and then study inhibition of virus replication and then dissect it at a molecular level. I have another question then. How many cell types of the Drosophila are infected with the Wolbachia? Oh, I, from what I understand, it's widespread. Many, many different cells. So it has to at least be in the reproductive cells because otherwise it wouldn't be ready yes. to be transmitted to the offspring. They say this is maternally transmitted. What does that mean? In the it? egg, probably in the egg. It goes from egg to the... And not, yeah. The guys have nothing to do with it. A uh, sperm that's so small, it could pro probably not accommodate a bacterium, no mm. less a bacteria. Ah, but the ovum is much bigger. Women rule, right? They always have. They always will. Amazing. All right, well, we're just here to fill in the blanks, Dick. We are. But, but I wanted to construct an experimental protocol to, mm -hmm. to now, sure. since we've given our audience a fairly general approach to Virology 101 and some of our podcasts, to invite in the listeners as to how they would go about telling the difference between the Wolbachia species as to what they might be doing for the host. Right. Now, one approach would be to do subtractive hybridization, wouldn't it? Compare them, sure. Right? Take out everything yeah, that's the sure. same and just study what the differences are. Mm -hmm. So you could, mm -hmm. you could clone up those proteins and just sort of uh, transfect cells and see whether just the protein alone offered the same amount of protection. Right. So the fact that you have different Wolbachia that have different effects is useful, and you can take advantage of that to try and understand what's going on. Yeah. So would this have any practical application, do you yeah, think? Yeah, I Vince? think so. I mean, if you can figure out the mechanism of inhibition, then maybe you could translate that into a therapeutic, right? Well, what if this turns out to be one of the causes of colony collapse syndrome for bees? Oh, that the bacteria go away? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So then you just reintroduce the Wolbachia. I or, wouldn't be surprised if that hadn't been tried already, no? Well, I don't think the actual cause of the colony collapse syndrome has been pinned down yet, but I think they're thinking about viruses. If that's the case, then maybe insinuating a Wolbachia species that could attack that virus in some indirect way yeah, or prevent sure. it from growing might save a very, very uh, endangered industry right now. Yeah, I have Because not, heard, only, um, not only do bees pollinate, mm -hmm. but they produce honey, but the pollination aspect of what they do is critical for some commercial farming. Sure. You know, I haven't heard anyone mention Wolbachia together with colony collapse, have you? Not at all. And I know we have at least one beekeeper listening in California. Great. Who has actually written, I asked him a few weeks ago to give us his take on colony collapse. He wrote us a nice email, which we'll have to read soon. Mm -hmm. If you have any idea about Wolbachia and colony collapse, let us know, or anyone else. That would be great. Sure. Now, in looking at this story, Dick, I found a third paper, which okay. will round up our <laughs> Wolbachia, which you're going to love. It's in a journal called PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. Oh, I love that one. If you were still researching, you'd be publishing here, right? Oh, that's true. Is and trichinella I, neglected? Of course. Uh, it's not a <laughs> tropical disease, however. Yeah, it isn't. You're right. I think the editor-in-chief of this is Peter Hotez, and he's a good friend of mine. It could be. It could be. But anyway, this journal article is called Wolbachia Infection Reduces Blood Feeding Success in the Dengue Fever Mosquito Aedes aegypti. Wow. So you put, well, now, this is a different effect of what wow. we're talking about, but it is an effect. You put Wolbachia in the mosquito, and they don't... What does blood feeding success mean, Dick? It means how much blood the a female uh, Aedes takes up and then how many eggs she produces based on the protein that she derives from the red cells from that blood meal. Hmm. So here what they do, they do a series of blood-feeding trials. Mm -hmm. So I guess they put the mosquitoes on people. They don't have to. On animals of some You could kind. membrane feed them with artificial... It says with, in a, uh, a series of blood-feeding trials in response to humans. Uh, okay, but a lot of them do insert their arms into the cages and allow okay. them to feed. We've shown that Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes do not differ in their response time, but as they age, they obtain fewer and smaller blood meals than uninfected controls. Wow. So the idea is that this could be used to interfere with dengue transmission, right? Well, well that's a bit of a stretch. 
And what they say here is that it gets worse, so the young mosquitoes are okay, even with the Wolbachia. It's only as they get old that they have this problem. Right. So I think what actually would be of practical application, and not for dengue because it's a vertically transmitted virus, mm -hmm. but rather for malaria. This mosquito doesn't transmit malaria, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Anopheline mosquitoes that do. But right. what if Anopheline mosquitoes had a similar infection and allowed the mosquito to only bite once? Yes. You could solve the malaria problem. Once is not enough to transmit, you say? Once is not enough because it has to acquire the infection first and then it has to bite again to transmit it. Ah, I see. So we'll take that first bite and that's it. Yes, you, we talked about this many, many twibs yeah, ago. Yeah, and there's a possible connection. If you could mm -hmm. take that same bacteria and infect Anopheline mosquitoes and make them only bite once, they would fulfill their re reproductive imperative right. and we would avoid malaria. So you don't think this is a good uh, strategy here? Well, I mean, Aedes aegypti is an easy mosquito to work with because it, it lays its eggs on the rim of paper that's submerged in water. Yeah. The eggs then dry, and you can store them for months to years without losing viability. Anopheline mosquitoes require water surface to lay their eggs, and you have to keep the colony going in another way. But, but wouldn't um, decreasing blood uh, taking decrease dengue transmission? Sure. If... But on that first bite, remember there's a horizontal transmission, a vertical transmission rather. So the mosquito is fully loaded with virus, virus I see. to begin with. So the first okay. bite is still going to transmit the dengue. So you're saying that even if you have reduced blood feeding success, you're still going to probably put a little. As virus long as it in, doesn't yeah. affect the first blood meal, it's no difference. Yeah, it? right. The problem I had here was that whenever you put a gene into a mosquito, they want to put these bacteria in the mosquito <laughs> and release them. Right. They have to be able to compete and actually outcompete the existing population. No question. In a super Mendelian way, right? No question. So if there's any deficit, they're not going to succeed. That's correct. And they're very excited because they say, oh, there's no apparent deficit at a young mosquito age. But who knows? Right. That's in the lab, right? But there is. If you look over time, I'm sure if you do the mathematical model mm -hmm. and compare the non-infected to the infected, some of them do feed twice and produce several batches of eggs. Yes, yes. So, you know, you're going to actually uh, out, get out-competed by the wild type again. But what I would like to know is, is there a molecular uh, basis that you could take advantage of and transfect the mosquitoes so they didn't have to carry the bacteria, they could just produce the protein? Absolutely. That would be much simpler, right? Then right. you reduce the chances of having a negative effect, having the whole bacterium there. That's right. right. So, Dick, what they say is they think that the mechani mechanism of uh, reduced blood feeding success is that the mosquitoes have a bendy proboscis. Let me explain <laughs> this. You know, when they try and, and yeah, stick yeah, it yeah, in, yeah. it bends, you know? Right, right, right. So the bacteria actually weakens their ability yeah. to probe based on a structural difference? Well, I did. That's what they observed. I don't know if they have any structural difference, but maybe they're abnormal biting behavior. Let's have a look at this picture because you're the mosquito expert here. Yeah, well, that's out of two people. Come on, that's not the... <laughs> Tony James, by the way, who's uh... <laughs> <laughs> this photo didn't load completely. Oh, oh there we go. It's still going. Oh, see, Dick, this guy, the proboscis is. Where is it? Is it is that a leg or is it? Yeah, it's there? here. It's and this one, here. it's bent. That's right. So, it's lost some structural integrity. Now it's supposed to go straight in, and it's bending on the That's skin. That's correct. This guy is probably frustrated. He can't. It's, it's get... a woman. It's not a. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Only the she's take blood. Yeah, interesting. So the the guy who worked out the transfection regime for mosquitoes mm -hmm. is Tony James, and the reason why everybody else failed in attempts to transfect mosquitoes is because they were using the wrong promoter sequences. Guess mm -hmm. which promoter sequences he used? Trichinella. No, no, Drosophila. Is that they right? They were already available. I don't know why I said trichinella. I don't either. I you... <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that was your, the thing. You know? Well, at one time, I mean, this is not under the heading of bragging, but I must say that I was deeply honored to, at one point, be the chairman of a Gordon conference on parasitism. Mm -hmm. This was back in the late 80s. And uh, I invited Tony James to give his presentation of uh, his attempts to transfect mosquitoes right and uh he f he had failed up to that point but eventually he succeeded and how did he know he succeeded in transfecting mosquitoes he used fluorescent green protein mm. as the reporter gene. reporter absolutely <laughs> excellent he, he ended up with an horrific looking mosquito that if you blew mm. this up onto a, a billboard and said the attack of the giant mosquitoes and it had these big fluorescent green eyes you could have scared the bejesus out of out of half of the world. Great. I like that. <laughs> now you can uh, 
Well, if you release those into the environment, then you could see them really well right there. You could. You could. That's a great idea, by the way. Now you have to shine UV light on them, though. Well, there's plenty of UV light out there, right? There's tons of it. Anyway, that's Wolbachia. I like that. I think that's very interesting. Well, it offers lots of biological control possibilities. A lot of questions here. Very interesting. Yep. Now, Dick, before we move on, yes. I'd like to acknowledge the support of TWIV by Go to My PC, which is made by Citrix. Here's the problem. I've been recommending Go to My PC for a while now. We've been sponsored by Citrix since uh, May, I think. But I know a few of our listeners still haven't tried the program. How can that be? Now, maybe they're worried about security. So let's try to reassure them. Go to My PC is as secure as online banking. Brought to you by Citrix, Go to My PC has state of the art security, which includes. SSL encrypted website, end-to-end -end AES, 128-bit encryption of the data stream, and keyboard and mouse input, multiple passwords, additional features including lockout protection, inactivity timeout, that means if you don't do anything, that's AFK, Dick, AFK, away from keyboard. Okay. My son always tells me that. Dad, I'm AFK. Right. Inactivity timeout, host screen blanking and the ability to lock the host keyboard and mouse. So what this means, it's, a, it's a very secure. So you don't have to worry about anyone hacking into your meeting or your data or anything of that sort. Sounds good. Okay. So our listeners, the wonderful TWIV listeners, can try Go to My PC free for 30 days. That's a month of unlimited remote access for free. For this special offer, you must visit www.gotomypc.com slash podcast. That's gotomypc.com slash podcast, a free trial. Can't beat it. Try it out. We thank Citrix for their support you bet. of TWIV and education. That's what we're trying to do here is teach. So now we have two other stories, which are actually stimulated by email. Okay, Great. So the first one is from Heidi. Hello, I'm a clinical virologist currently in training to become a microbiology infectious disease specialist, and I love TWIV. I do mainly routine diagnostic work, so there's something new for me in every episode. I have a suggestion. What about a cytomegalovirus special? Oh. What do you think? Sure. All right, it's a great idea. It is. We shall do that. CMV is a good one. And a question. Could you comment on the attached article by Gibbs et al., from where did the 2009 swine origin influenza A virus H1N1 emerge? What's your opinion on the two proposed origin of pandemic H1N1? Hmm. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Heidi. Okay. You didn't say where she's from. I don't know where she's from. Oh, okay. She didn't say. All right. See, it just says Heidi. Here. Yeah, no, I kind of... Sometimes people don't put at the end uh, where they're from. Right. So this is a paper that was just published recently in Virology Journal mm -hmm. by Adrian Gibbs, who is um, down under it's in Australia, and a couple of colleagues. And this actually, he actually was uh, in the press way back in April when the H1, swine origin H1N1 emerged, and he was saying it could be a lab-generated virus. So now he's put his theory on paper here. And so that's what this is about. So let's summarize the story here. It's very interesting. So this virus, as everyone probably knows, but if you don't, let's review it. First found in people in Mexico, has at least three different parents. Six of the genes of this virus are close to what we call a triple assortant virus, which are isolated from North American pigs from around 1999 to 2000. Okay? The other two genes are from different Eurasian pig influenza viruses. So the neuraminidase is closest to H1N1 pig viruses isolated in Europe from 91 to 93, and the M gene, the M protein gene, is closest to H3N2 viruses of pigs isolated in Asia in 1999 to 2000. So three different parents from three different continents. Sounds unlikely that they'd ever get together, doesn't it? Well, that's one of his arguments, actually. He said, what is the likelihood that these three would ever get together? Sure. Dick, you are right on this. Absolutely. I'm so glad you're here today. Uh, me too. 
<laughs> You're right on I'm that. so glad I'm here, period. <laughs> so, he, so one of the interesting issues here is that if you notice what I said, these are related to viruses that were close, most closely related to the parents were circulating years ago, 1999, right. 1991, right. 1999 again. There's no recent virus related to, to the swine origin. It's all quite a few years ago. Right. And what would that mean to you, Dick? Well, if I had to think about this as an ecobiologist, mm -hmm. I would start with the premise that influenza viruses are native infections of birds rather than mammals. Mm -hmm. Mammals are, are reservoirs for the infections, but in fact, it's birds that distribute them throughout the world, and migrating birds, of course, but also domestic fowl. And there's a rich trade in um, taking domestic fowl from continent to continent for mm -hmm. trade purposes. So it, it's not unlikely that some of these strains of viruses could be transported from, let's say, Asia to Europe. By birds. By birds that are housed in containers that are being sold on open markets, for instance, in Europe. Yeah, I mean, he considers that, and he says the pigs are really quarantined quite strictly. So he thinks that's not unlikely that that happened. Unless they're in an ICU unit or a P3 yeah, facility, true. I don't believe don't that. Believe that. <laughs> so no. are these pigs out in the field at some point, or they're always housed? Well, even if they're always housed, if you've ever gone into a piggery, even if the ones that you've gone into are in mm -hmm. Iowa, which are very hermetically sealed units, most of them, yeah. uh, there are still plenty of opportunities for... Uh, a bird to get in? Or from materials to get out. A number of years ago, we were up in western Canada, and... Uh, my daughter, there was a pig farm nearby, and my daughter wanted to go see a piglet. So we went, knocked on the door, and the farmer said, you know, I can't do it. I can't let people in the pig area. It's against our, whatever, the the FDA equivalent, yeah. not FDA, the Agricultural Department in sure, Canada. is. Sure. said, we can't risk contamination. And this was 10 years ago before yep. this swine origin. So it's, you know, they do follow strict rules, but a bird could get in. All you need is one farm to violate that rule, though, too. Absolutely. So he goes through some very interesting uh, sequence analyses, phylogenetic studies, mm -hmm. which show to me that actually he knows what he's doing. He and his co-authors know what they're doing. They have very cogent arguments. And basically the summary is that, so he says, based on all these phylogenetic analyses, which show that the ancestors of this virus haven't been around for a while, let's use this to construct plausible scenarios of the ways in which the virus might, might have been originated. This is a useful exercise because we might get clues. Well, here's the evidence. The virus emerged into humans on one occasion, probably in Mexico. Two, it's a reassortant with three viruses as parents, all of them viruses of pigs. Three, the parents were last sampled directly in three very distant parts of the world. The parental And four, the parental genes were last sampled more than a decade ago. Two were sampled 11 years ago, the third 17 years ago. So one possibility, it could have been generated by natural means. It could have been assembled in one place by birds, as you suggest. However, the link of swine origin viruses, immediate ancestors with pigs, suggests that human activity of some sort was involved. So he thinks, that you get that argument, right, Dick? Yeah. All right, so that's one possibility, to rise by natural means. And we have this long period where there's nothing related to these viruses, and so many people have said, well... That's because in a lot of areas we don't isolate viruses from pigs very often. So it's an unsampled pig herd theory. And that's why we're missing these. All right. Right. And our friend here, Raul Rabadon, is a supporter of that theory. Mm -hmm. They can, so our friends conclude given the lack of sampling of pigs in certain parts of the world, it is perhaps not surprising that the ancestors have gone unnoticed for almost two years. So the authors of this paper say it is important to note that this theory depends on the intercontinental movement of live infected pigs and requires at least two quarantine breaching incursions involving three different countries. And it, but still not unlikely. He thinks that. Well, he says, however, viruses of the Eurasian lineages have never been found in North America. Okay. And North American triple reassortants haven't been found in Europe. So he says there is some containment, right? But I guess there can always be an exception, right, Dick? And remember why we can't export our pigs. Why is that? Back at the turn of the century, the 19th century. Trichinella. That's right. And that's in TWIP number three, which will be released in a few weeks. This is true. <laughs> now I get it, Dick. All right. I'm learning so much. Hey, me too. So that's his first theory, that it arose in pigs naturally, but he's a little suspicious because there's. it looks like the pig herds are pretty isolated. But Dick's point about the birds is good. 
Why not? Mm-hmm. His second theory is the laboratory error. He said somewhere in the world, someone was working with all three parent viruses, and you know they <laughs> reassorted in cell culture, and somehow they got into a pig herd, and now they're in people. Okay, so he gives these equal weight, but he wants us to consider the latter, the laboratory error theory. All right, so you know how that would work, right? You'd have to have all three viruses working in the hood, infecting cells, or maybe two at once, and then this third one coming in. I don't know, Dick. It's possible, but it seems to me, first of all, I don't know what lab has all three parent viruses in yeah, it. I think you could find that exactly. out. Sure. And to have all three at the same time, I yeah, just yeah. don't know, Dick. I think it's pretty unlikely. Mm, but it I'm, is theoretically possible. Okay. Right? Yep. Well, uh, why don't we take another example of another laboratory that has all 23 strains of viruses in their lab all at once? Vincent Doible. Wow. You've read my mind at the Pasteur Institute, and they have remained separated and, yes. and categorized ever since he reported that. Yeah, but you know, Dick, even though everybody's good, many people are good, there's always going to be an accident. Right? You're quite right. And we know that flu viruses have gotten out of labs before. The 1977 yep. H1N1 got so out of labs somewhere. So, you know, pharmaceutical companies send influenza viruses by mistake. And hover mouth disease, too. So, sure, I don't think you could ever rule it out. Nope. So in the end, he says, two contrasting possibilities have been described and discussed, but more data are needed to distinguish between them. And he says, we have to go out there and find all the labs that have all these viruses, sequence them, get more isolates from pigs, have a registry of flu labs, who, who's working with what strains. <clears throat> Brother. Never going to happen, no, is it, Dick? No. no. It's hard enough to get money to do research, but to pay for all that is not going to happen. And WHO certainly doesn't have the resources either. So my feeling in this is that it is theoretically possible. I don't think we can ever prove it, just as we have not proven that the 77 virus, H1N1, came out of a lab. I suspect that it's it's a naturally occurring mm. incident. We know that new flu viruses arise naturally. It's happened before we had labs working on them. That's right. And it will happen again. Well, what do you think, Dick? Oh, I, I, I lean towards the ecological explanations. Do you think that it's worth bringing this up at all? Well, the obvious uh, reason why we're doing this is because one of our listeners was curious about the interpretation of the paper. Right. So what do we end up telling that listener? That it's possible, but we don't think it's likely? Right. And then someone will say, well, why not? Why don't you think it's... (laughs) I know. (laughs) That's a topic that would better be discussed over a pint of nice ale. (laughs) Well, I mean... Because you're never going to be able to find out by just talking about it. I think putting percentages or likelihood is very difficult. It is. We should just end up saying they're both possible. It's true. But historically, as far as we know, most of the new influenza viruses emerge naturally from an ecological... That's correct. There are so many different animals. It's not. Uh, there was only hard one. Believe it. One major outbreak of something that everybody panicked over the moment they understood it was from a laboratory accident, and that was the, uh, I guess it was the Ebola virus in Reston, Virginia, mm-hmm. that was not the same Ebola virus strains that you would find in the more pathogenic. But uh, once that got into some monkeys and uh, infected them, as I recall the story, um, the likelihood was that this thing could get out the next. The next step was to release this on the public. Mm-hmm. It turned out to be a non-pathogenic strain. Yeah. And as a result, uh, it sort of quelled the uh, the interest in the outbreak, but nonetheless, it was a, of a very dangerous virus. Could have been a, it could have been the opposite result, right? And it was a lab accident. And remember the story about uh, loss of fever that went up to Yale, and then one of the lab workers sure, died, and sure, Jordi Casals sure. caught it. And so there are even professionals that are good at this can often become contaminated. Accidents will always happen. Accidents so will always it happen. Is, this is theoretically possible. It and is. Everything, so I think we'll end with everything we know about this new virus uh, is cannot, we cannot rule out that it happened in a lab or in an animal. We can't. And right. We can't. And the it's point too bad this wasn't uh, published in PLOS because both hypotheses are plausible. Oh, boy. <laughs> You've taken uh, Alan's place today. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's... Dick, um, it's Friday. <laughs> uh, one more, one more thought on this. Sure. Oh, it's it's flying away. <laughs> oh yes, this is an ax. If anything, it would be an accident. No one made this on purpose. I no. still contend that that would be virtually impossible to do to make the right yeah, that's combination. Right. That's right. That's right. right. All right. Then we had a, a note from Justin who wrote, "Doc, could you please perhaps comment on this in your next twiv? 
There seem to be a fair number of people that are concerned that getting the vaccine for the pandemic strain is going to leave them susceptible to this phenomenon, if you will, especially with live virus vaccine. So this is a paper. This is an original antigenic sin. Dick, do you know uh, original antigenic sin? Do you know this phenomenon? I was a Catholic at one point. I have... <laughs> oh, you were. <laughs> I have no opinions on this whatsoever. That's a great name. This is a phenomenon. All right. So, you know, in most infections, you get an infection with a microbe, and then you have a memory established either in antibodies or cells, T cells. And then when you get reinfected, you have a response to that pathogen. Right. The phenomenon of original antigenic sin is a paradox. Humans, when infected with a novel flu strain, produce antibodies against older strains that they've been exposed to at the expense of responses to the new strain. Isn't, so that was first discovered by Tom Francis in uh, the 40s. And uh, Tom Francis was the guy who ran the polio clinical trial of Salk's vaccine, actually. And he first he had worked on influenza vaccines for many years. And he found that natural infection in humans with antigenically drifted strains of virus induced antibody production against their childhood strains, but the response against the current strain was very diminished. Mm. So this was called original antigenic sin. What a great name. <laughs> Only from a Christian, right? Only. So it refers to, I think, original sin is the stuff that Adam and Eve did, right? That's the idea? You know, Do you remember that? I'd rather not get involved right, in this discussion. <laughs> original antigenic sin. Nice name. There's still some controversy over whether it's a real phenomenon associated with flu vaccines. All right, And there have been a couple of studies looking at this. Now, Could you call this one déjà flu? Déjà flu. Oh, boy. Okay. One of our readers said sometimes she has to rewind and listen to our jokes over again to get them. <laughs> so this is a paper just published in the Journal of Immunology, and it's called Original Antigenic Sin Responses to Influenza Viruses. They basically take mice, and they infect them with two different strains of flu, right. and they see what's going on here. So they say it's a real thing. All right, using, All right. using yes. two related strains of influenza virus, we show that original antigenic sin leads to a significant decrease in development of protective immunity and recall responses to the second virus. Do you have a, a mechanism that you can use to account for this? I do. I do. I, I'm glad. Well, they I don't that. actually. They do. Okay. But let me finish telling you the results, and then I'll tell you their mechanism. Very good. So what they found is that when they first, when they immunized mice with a DNA vaccine encoding the hemagglutinin, and they got this strong original sin response. So they put HA DNA of one strain first and then another later, and they get responses to the first strain. And then they actually challenge the mice with viruses to see what happens. And with DNA vaccines, they get a really strong original antigenic sin. How close are these two viruses? It's a good question. These are The HA is 92% similar. Oh, come on then. So There's lots of different. shared epitopes, right? Shared and also different. Well, that's an interesting question. The extent to which distance is required is unknown, but the relationship has to be small. So the strains, if the strains are related, this doesn't happen. If there are a lot of shared epitopes, you don't see this effect. It's only with different viruses. So this would not be an issue in seasonal vaccines. It would only be an issue when you get a pandemic vaccine, which is this year. <laughs> so... Yeah, but so that raises the natural question of, in the new virus, what is the epitope that triggers the reaction to the old epitope? So you're saying if there's nothing shared, yeah, what would trigger it? Well, maybe that's the problem, that the, the B memory B cells are only remembering the old strain. But what is, this must be a cross-reacting epitope, then, no? Because you're getting a secondary response, I don't basically. believe it's a cross-reacting epitope, no. Is Here's this, what they say, Dick. Yeah, go ahead. We propose a model in which, and I don't completely understand this, in which original antigenic sin occurs due to competition between antigen-specific memory and naive B cells for common epitopes. So when you inject the second one, there's I competition see, see, between see, memory see, cells see, and, see, and the new B cells that haven't seen anything. That, that's the theory. But let me tell you why this isn't so cut and dried. In contrast to the induction of original antigenic sin by immunization with DNA vaccines, Sequential immunization with formalin inactivated viruses did not show overt evidence for original antigenic sin. And that's the majority of the vaccine we're using. Right. So when they did formalin killed virus immunization of mice, the second uh, virus that was immunized, they got the same, there was no bias towards the antibody response of the original. Right. But 
Listen to this. This is very interesting. Despite these minimal differences in serum neutralization and HA titers, these mice were clearly compromised in generating memory responses. So when they were challenged with virus, mm, mm, mm. They, were, they were still more susceptible to the new strain rather than the old one. So there's some deficit in establishing the memory pool. But just for those epitopes, of course. Just for those epitopes. Now, the, I should point out, so this is in mice. This is done in, in, in a number of animals. There are a number of other studies that contradict these data. So this is not generally agreed. So another what study... What strain of mouse, by the way? Now, that's a good question. I don't know if that makes a difference well, it's here, used, it's a but huge it probably difference. would. Oh, come on, Vince. Another, several other groups have published that they don't see the same effect. But the, if, if they don't use the same strains of mice and the same strains of virus, then you can't say that. I think these guys tried to use two flu strains that had been used in the 50s in the original studies, uh, but I don't know if they used the same mice or not. I mean, but I agree. I think that you're right. I think that's a potential confounding These arguments factor. come up all the time, and when you review papers and one contradicts the other, and then one's using a C3H mouse and the other was using a DBA2 mouse, all right. you say, you're for, right. for God's sake, so, you're, not even, you're talking about apples and storm doors. It's not even apples and bananas. So let's do it in humans. That's even worse. Rapid, here's a nice paper. <laughs> it's from Nature... Rapid cloning of high affinity human monoclonal antibodies against influenza virus. So they basically immunized people and cloned out B cells from them that produced antibodies against influenza virus. Okay. The panel of influenza virus specific human monoclonal antibodies allowed us to address the issue of original antigenic sin, which we've just defined. We found that most of the influenza virus-specific monoclonal antibodies showed the highest affinity for the current vaccine strain. Thus, original antigenic sin does not seem to be a common occurrence in normal, healthy adults receiving influenza vaccination. There you go. There's a little bit of disagreement. So humans Uh, versus mice versus strains. uh, The arguments are moot because you can't... Again, this is not even apples and storm doors. This is like different planetary geologies. So this is I mean, what I wanted to do with this, Dick, is to put this out there and, and, and in the end say, should people not get the pandemic vaccine because of this concern? Uh, but of course not. Why not? Uh, because those are, those are incomplete studies that have nothing to do with reality. Not the real world. These are very constrained um, conditions. By using inbred strains of mice and older strains of, of viral infections, you're, you're playing with systems that have nothing to do with the human condition, which is a hetero... It's so non-inbred mm-hmm. that, that virtually each one of us is a um, right. uh, heterozygote. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to use the right genetic term here to indicate yes. that we have so much genetic variability yes. among us that you couldn't possibly compare us to a strain of mouse. So that the results that you get from a strain of mouse, even if our immune systems were identical to mouse and it's not, uh, you still must do this in, are there inbred strains of people? Mm, not that I know of. Well, if you go to Iceland, oh yeah, well, the okay. genotypes of Icelanders are pretty close You're, to each that, other. I think that's a good point. But uh, this human study, I think, is is very interesting because it shows that if you are immunized, those cells that immediately they, respond they to they the pick imaging, up the new ones. They pick up the new one, and this year, that's what's happening with the pandemic right. vaccine. You're going to get the vaccine within right. a month or two. Right. It doesn't involve a memory response. It involves no. the initial naive B cells that are still there. That's correct. All right. If it were a pro- if you were challenged next year, maybe a memory would be against the original one. Sure. But we're talking about immediate response. In that case, you should be protected. I mean, you either way, you should be protected. You should be protected. So Dick is right. This is an unresolved issue. But on top of that, get the, vac- the pandemic vaccine now. It's going to protect you at least for the next couple of months. Yeah. Without needing a memory response. You should never right. not get it based on these kinds of studies. Yes, okay. <laughs> that would be the most obtuse reasoning for not getting the vaccine Absolutely. I could possibly Absolutely. think of. So then uh, th- that's your, your answer, Justin. You had another question. We're going to save it till next week because yeah. we want to read a few emails and then wrap it up. That's right. Swiss Compass wrote, Aha. Uh-huh. Between So he has a quote here. Between September 27th and October 3rd, health authorities confirmed 373 new cases of dengue in Jalisco, Mexico, the highest number ever recorded in a single week, oh. 67 of the more serious hemorrhagic kind. Total number of cases of dengue confirmed in Jalisco is now 2,360, over 10% of which are hemorrhagic. That's quite an epidemic. It's an epidemic of dengue. Just to remind everyone that it's H1N1 is not the only 
pandemic at the moment. This I would say dengue is a pandemic as well, oh, yeah, right? Absolutely. Now, Lisco leads the Mexican League table for suspected cases of dengue, with 26,537 probable cases recorded up until late September. Mm. So we sent a link to an article. So what would be the effect of someone acquiring influenza of the H1N1 strain and dengue? At the what same a good time? question. One could interfere with the other. Do you remember? Or they could be synergistic and produce Terrible lethality. Disease. And that's something you could study if you had good sure. uh, isolation data and good epidemiology data. Do you remember right? the original outbreak from Mexico for H1N1 included a lot of deaths in children? Mm -hmm. And people were afraid this was the next big flu pandemic yes. of the yes. swine flu from 1918. But maybe there was an undercurrent of other uh, infections. Something else, absolutely. I don't think it's been ruled out yet. Because the mortality rate's about the same as regular flu, right? Yeah, Dick, it, it takes time for data to come in about this, right? That's correct. And it's not there yet. No. Uh, Swiss Compass goes on to write, a pig that was shown at the Minnesota State Fair two months ago has <laughs> tested positive for H1N1 virus, making it the first case of a pig contracting the virus in the U.S., federal officials said. Somebody so this virus, sneezed on that pig. The virus <laughs> apparently can infect pigs as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the pig workers go in, or in this case, it's a pig fair. You have a lot of people near that pig. Right? Sure. He sent a picture of a baby kissing a pig. <laughs> which is a good way to get viruses to the pig, right? Jim writes, My sister in Tucson emailed this item from Dr. Goyal. I don't know how she got it. It's helpful as a layperson to hear expert comments about such protective measures as these. Can you suggest a good way to determine if something like gargling or cleaning nasal cavities where you pour salty water in one nose and let it flow out the other have any merit? So Dr. Goyal is a uh, physician with clinical experience in India, and he writes... The only portals of entry are the nose and mouth throat for flu. Okay, that's fine. In a global epidemic of this nature, it's almost impossible not coming into contact with H1N1 in spite of all precautions. Contact with H1N1 is not so much of a problem as proliferation. I think he means replication. While you are still healthy and not showing any symptoms of infection in order to prevent proliferation, aggregation of symptoms, and development of secondary infections, some very simple steps should be practiced. One, frequent hand washing. Agreed? Okay. Two, hands off the face. Impossible. But it's not a bad idea. Resist all temptations to touch any part of your face. For how long? Yeah, good question. Come on, I when think you it's sleep? Un it's unpracticable. Oh, when you sleep, you automatically you touch can't. it. can't. But he's talking about when you're out in public and you're touching, you know, publicly touched understood, things understood. with viruses on them. Try and wash your hands before you touch, but it's very difficult, right? But it's not bad advice, right? It's great advice, but it's like telling a kid stop putting things in their mouth. I mean, they're just yeah. going to do it because it's a natural reaction. It's like telling reaction. me to stop working on viruses. <laughs> three, gargle twice a day with warm salt water. Mm. He says the virus takes two to three days after infection to proliferate, so gargling prevents that. All right, so I think this is a waste of time because you can gargle, but then in 10 minutes you'll have a new crop of viruses coming in. You can't gargle continuously, right? No. So that's negative. Similar to three above, clean your nostrils every day with warm water. You know, <laughs> again, you could get rid of virus that's there, but how do you know when you actually get the inoculum? You don't know, and it can reintroduce Wait, after gargling. Right? What if there you get it... And, and are viruses extracellular or intracellular organisms? You're right. You know, it, they get into cells pretty quickly. And once so, they do... Uh, you can't get rid of them with salt. <laughs> thank good you. point. Or anything else for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Unless you slept the cell layer off. Boost your natural immunity with foods that are rich in vitamin C. No, now, no, Linus Pauling went down in flames on that one. No proven help. You could get crystals of vitamin C in your urine, taking so much of it, and it still wouldn't affect the flu virus. Thank you. Finally, drink as much warm liquids as you can. It has the same effect of gargling, but in the reverse direction. No, it's got the same effect as your mother no. patting you on the head and tucking you in. So none of this is terribly useful, Jim, for those reasons, but washing your hands, First one hands off the face. Yeah. Washing your hands is great, but hands off the face is impractical, and the rest just yeah. don't work. What you might want to do is say, don't shake hands with somebody who just sneezed in their own hands. Right. You know, use common sense. Okay, hey, John writes, although I have not written in some time, I want to give you all my thanks for the continuation of your collective podcast and to Professor Racaniello in particular for his leadership in this project and his daily blog snippets. I follow each thoroughly. A few times, some of the discussion did go over my head, and as a result, I'm now listening to several cell biology and microbiology <laughs> courses through iTunes U. 
and this has been useful in filling the voids of my understanding of cell biology structure and mechanics. I am now a little insufferable around friends when the topic of flu comes up, and I try to set them straight about many of the myths and misunderstandings which circulate on the web. Good. We have a, a John is from Kansas. Mm-hmm. Thanks, John. Last email is from Robin. Hi there. First off, thank you for a fantastic show. I've been listening to your podcast for some time now and have recommended it to many. Thank you very much, Robin. Indeed. I had a question for which I have desperately been hoping to find an answer. Uh Uh-oh. Months after a sudden onset of flu-like symptoms, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. And Mm. seven years later, I'm still very much sick. About 10 days prior to the first symptoms, I had discovered a mouse in my desk at work who had been munching on the nuts and other snacks. I know for a fact I had been eating food contaminated with mouse saliva and fecal matter. Subsequently, I had plenty of aerosol exposure to the mouse feces as I was cleaning the desk. Is it theoretically possible for XMRV to be transmitted in such a manner? I figured if anyone would know the answer, it would be you guys. Thank you so much for everything. So, Dick, you know, XMRV is this new virus implicated in chronic fatigue. I was part of that uh, presentation. So, could you have gotten it from this mouse? Mm -hmm. All right, so chronic XMRV is very similar to viruses in mice. So, yes, in theory, it could have been transmitted to you. But let me tell you this. So far, all of the isolates of XMRV, XMRV from people from diverse geographical areas are very similar in sequence which suggests that there are only one or very few introductions of the virus from mice to people. And maybe there was one introduction many years ago, and that that has subsequently spread among people. You could find out by having your genome, the, the virus in you, XMRV, sequenced to see if it's similar to the existing ones, in which case it's unlikely you got it from that mouse. Right. Or if it's totally different, in which case it's possible that you did get it from the mouse. So in theory, it's possible because the mice have that virus that infected you. Um, But since all the isolates so far are really similar, I think it's unlikely. I think this virus went into people many, many years ago, just as HIV went into people many years ago, and it's been transmitted among people. What do you think? Is that reasonable, Dick? Sounds very reasonable to me. Okay, that'll do it for email. Let's do a pick of the week and wrap it up. You've got anything to pick this week? Uh, no? I, I, not in particular, Vince. I'm sorry to say. All right, Dick, you're fired. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> well, I have a pick. Maybe while I'm picking, you can think a little more, but uh, people are going to be so disappointed, Dick. Oh. It's okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just making you feel bad. It'll take more than that to make me feel bad, Vince. <laughs> this, is a web, this is a web page called Information is Beautiful. Uh-huh. So this is a person who, it, the subtitle is Ideas, Issues, Knowledge, Data, Visualized. He makes pictures of information. Does this sound familiar to you? Sounds like a tough to approach to yes. me. Yes. So he's taken data on, is this H1N1 swine flu vaccine safe and made pictures of it? <laughs> so what is it? Who should get it? Who should not get it? What are the two types of vaccine? How protective? What about adjuvant? Who's using it? What if I'm pregnant? What about mercury? Side effects? Who gets it? What are the chances? Mm. All visually illustrated. And at the bottom, of course, wow. he's got his source wow. for all this data. So um, I think this is beautiful, and everyone should look at this. So it's nice. called Information is Beautiful, and we will post a link to that, as usual, in the show notes. Last chance, Dick? No, no links? I'm drawing a blank here, Vince. But, are you, uh, you going to be with us next week, by the way? Why not? I don't know. You're a traveling guy. No, no, no. My travels are... So next week is December 11th. Yeah, the next time I travel, I will be in Patagonia for the month of January. So you're going to be gone the whole month. Yep. A month without Dick. Can we record some twips we at could. least? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Before you go? You bet. And some twips. Promise? Some Promise. twips also. Some twips. Like. I'd love to, Dick. Sure. I'll yeah. do a better job with the twips. As to the picks. Oh, that's fine. You've been a consistent picker, so uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound right, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a nitpicker. <laughs> if you're a new listener to Twiv, please consider subscribing in iTunes. It really helps us to do that, and it's free, and you automatically get every new episode. And if you leave a review at iTunes, that would be great, too. Mm-hmm. But if you can't use iTunes, and I know a lot of people don't, we have a website, twiv.tv where you can download episodes, you can play them, and you can look at our show notes and links. TWIV is part of microbeworld.org, a 
community created by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, to help disseminate information about microbes. You can also find TWIV at sciencepodcasters.org and promednetwork.com, websites where you can find high-quality science podcasts from a wide variety of fields. And, of course, do check out our latest podcast. What's that, Dick? TWIP. This Week in Parasitism at microbeworld.org slash twip. That's a lot of fun. The number two is up, and number three will be up in a couple of weeks. Maybe we should do two a month. Maybe. Who knows? Did, did we mention as a pick, I just, of course, this just came to me since you've put enormous pressure on I'm me. I'm sorry, Dick. Some, that's okay. Uh, it's called um, New Guinea Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers. Did we actually pick that as a pick? Never. No? What is it? Ah, it's a it's a wonderful book written by Robert Dezowitz. The Guinea okay. Tapeworms and Jewish Grandmothers. I'm pretty sure it's either that or New Jewish Grandmothers and New Guinea Tapeworms. But um, by who? By Robert Dezowitz. All right. And whether it's still in print or not, I don't know. But it's a series of anthropological, medical anthropological stories. Mm-hmm. And that was the first of three books that he wrote. Uh, the second book was on uh, who brought. Pinta to the Santa Maria. <laughs> <laughs> and the third book was an expose on the uh, uh, the malaria vaccine trials. Nice. Yeah. But All the, right. See, Dick, I knew with time you would come up with a pick. New Guinea tapeworms and Jewish grandmothers. Um, By Robert Desowitz. Those are two stories about how, how tapeworms are transmitted to Thank people. Thank you, Dick. I can do you this. You have a huge resource. All I need to do is... <laughs> Get it out. It's a little slower now than it used to be. Vince. No, no, it's not at all slow. You're fabulous. Thank you, Dick. As always, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. You can send us an email. You can send us an audio file. Or you can call up Skype and leave a message to Twiv Podcast over at microworld.org slash twiv. It's a way of uh, adding stories that you want us to talk about. If you find a story you'd like us to discuss on oh, Twiv, right, sure. you can tag it with Twiv over there if you want to check that out, if you're the um, social networking type. We might even want them to suggest a pick of the week every now and then. Oh, people do do that. It's excellent. And, of course, um, we're happy to receive them. Yep. Dick, thanks so much. Good to see you again. Pleasure. Trickinella.org. Yep. And is, medical ecology done. And you'll find Dick to those places. He's got a lot of information there. Go check that out. And we will see Dick next week. We will. For sure. We will. And hopefully Alan Dove will be back. Right. We'll make it today. Thank you for listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We will be back next week. Thanks for joining us. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.